One out of this world story after another. We're all Martians, and the search for extraterrestrial intelligence looks at another kind of tree and still misses the forest. This is Genesis Week. Welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, Season 3 of the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins controversy, made possible by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education, carried on the Miracle Channel in Canada, the Walk TV in the United States, and of course, the Chris Cinema Network on YouTube, ChrisCinema.com, Christian Cinema at its finest. Excellence in Pirate Broadcasting, we answer your questions and question your answers. We continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear and giving glory to our creator while doing it. We heard Genesis Week believe God gave you a but intelligently designed brain for a reason. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com or genesisweek.com and you can find us. And also subscribe to our YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. Let's get down to business. According to Professor Stephen Benner, your ancient ancestor may have been a Martian. Well, this might explain our fascination with Mars. What with 165,000 people from around the world signing up for a one-way trip to move to Mars on the Mars One project. And that Earth creature has stolen my space modulator. Oh no. Our fascination with Mars seems to be never ending. But wait for it because this story is even more of a stretch than you think. Now this call comes back to that pesky little problem of the origin of life. How did the first life arrive on Earth? Was it created or did it evolve? Naturalistic theories such as evolutionism must account for the origin of life. You gotta move from a rock to life and Benner's paper is a classic example of evolutionary thinkers trying to address that very real problem. Now, if you don't have life, then evolution is dead at the starting line. Many an extremist anti-creationist has attempted to divorce the origin of life from evolutionism, saying that evolution does not attempt to explain the origin of life. Such claims go completely against what is taught in our schools, Open any high school or university textbook on evolutionism, and you'll see the classic Miller-Urey experiment, for example. Now, this was an attempt to provide a naturalistic explanation for the origin of life. A fascinating experiment, which did produce some basic building blocks of life. In a toxic brew of tar and carboxylic acid, which would stop formation of any life, or kill any life that was in it. Now, you certainly can't call those basic building blocks life. I mean, this is akin to somehow making a pile of bricks. And now, how do you convert that pile of bricks into the Empire State Building by completely natural processes? No intelligence allowed. Well, it cannot be done. Then the anti-creationists make the shocking argument that the analogy of the Empire State Building does not apply to the origin of life because the Empire State Building doesn't reproduce, whereas life does. What? I mean, that's just the point. Tell me, which would be more complicated? An Empire State Building, or a living Empire State Building, which can build other state buildings just like it, completely on its own. In either case, the building simply cannot exist without an external, intelligent, designer. Now this is obvious to anyone. So why then, if we had found such a procreating building, would someone say that it had no creator? That it formed by natural processes and had no intelligent designer? You would say that person is either crazy or has ulterior motives. And so we come to the human being. 
astonishingly complex creatures, not just biologically, but with incredible intelligence, free will, emotions, a psyche. Deep down, we resent our creator. We resent that there is a creator and resent that we've been put on this horrible earth. And so we have a tenacious internal drive, a subconscious ulterior motive to deny the obvious, to deny that we have been created. Now, I hope you'll pardon my bluntness as all of these statements apply equally to myself. I too am subject to the same human drives, passions, phobias, etc. I've seen the power of the human mind to blind itself, and I have never seen it rear its ugly head more so than in the inner conflict caused by the obvious design of life, which demands a designer. Now, this conflict causes people to make statements that are obviously true, uh, such as life looks designed, but that that very same person will turn around and flatly deny what they just said was obvious. They will adamantly claim that life was not designed. In order to do this, they must now account for how the first life arose. You cannot separate evolution from the origin of life, and honest evolutionists have admitted this. It's included in our evolutionary textbooks, as I show in Crevo Rant number 63, Evolution and the Origin of Life. As I also document in my Genesis and Aliens DVD, the idea of aliens was inspired by evolutionary theory. As is commonly said, hey, we evolved here, surely life must have evolved somewhere else in the universe. And then the suggestion of panspermia. Perhaps aliens created us. Now, this does not answer the question of where did we come from, but only brings up the question, mm, where did the aliens come from? And in case you missed it, this brings us full circle to the recent seminar and paper by Dr. Benner on the origin of the first life and our second story coming up on the SETI project. Indirectly acknowledging that the first life cannot arise from a rock, here, on Earth, Dr. Benner suggests that perhaps it could have arose on Mars, because Mars apparently has special rocks. Benner proposed his theory at the annual Goldschmidt conference in Italy last week. It goes something like this. The first life molecules thought to have formed were RNA. But how would RNA molecules join together? You need something to act as a, a template to join the molecules together in the right order and shape. Now, it's been proposed that the minerals boron and molybdenum could act as the templates, but boron is pretty scarce on Earth and would have been dissolved in Earth's oceans. Also, the form of molybdenum that could act as a template has to have a lot of oxygen attached to it. And allegedly three billion years ago, there was very little oxygen on Earth. So by moving the problem to Mars, three billion years ago, it's assumed there was lots of oxygen there and very little water to dissolve the boron. And these minerals could have acted as templates for molecules to be made into RNA, which led to life. Then there was perhaps an asteroid impact on Mars, which launched debris into space, including some of this first life in perhaps the form of bacteria. Some of that bacteria landed on Earth, and voila, you now have life on Earth. Dr. Benner told a BBC reporter, The evidence seems to be building that we are actually all Martians, that life started on Mars and came to Earth on a rock. Now, that's an impressive sounding story, but just how possible is it? Let's analyze the assumptions. It's assumed there was little to no oxygen on Earth 3 billion years ago. Now, you all know that I do not believe in those long ages, but nevertheless, let's go with the evolutionary assumptions. Was there oxygen on Earth three billion years ago? All throughout the rock record, we find oxygen. You cannot escape this. In fact, I have fossil stromatolites in my museum collection that are alleged by evolutionists to be 3.4 billion years old. 
Now, stromatolites live in the water and produce oxygen. Obviously, then, there was water and oxygen. But what about the atmosphere? Well, you will have oxygen. Ozone is a form of oxygen. So if there is no oxygen in the atmosphere, there is no ozone. If there is no ozone, then ultraviolet light comes streaming in from the sun completely unhindered and strikes the ocean waters, breaking the water apart into hydrogen and free radical oxygen. You cannot escape it. The oxygen problem is a huge dilemma for the origin of life people. And it's interesting that Benner took a different approach and wanted more oxygen, not less. Now, is it possible that life could have been launched from Mars to Earth? Well, there has been multiple meteorites found on Earth which are claimed to have come from Mars. Well, how do we know they came from Mars? Well, science is the study of the natural world, so we really only have five options. We know the meteorites came from Mars because A. They look like they came from Mars B. They sound like they came from Mars C. They taste like they came from Mars D. They feel like they came from Mars and E. They smell like they came from Mars Now, depending on the meteorite and the report, the researchers usually conclude the meteorite in question came from Mars because of either its mineral content or its gas content Therefore, the correct answer would be either C or E. It tastes and or smells like it came from Mars. Now, this assertion is really unprovable. But let's assume that these are Martian rocks. If we found life on Mars, it would actually be more probable that that life came from Earth. After all, we have life here. And if an impact could toss bacteria out of orbit from Mars, then it could do the same here on Earth. But could RNA actually form on these crystalline templates? Well, even that becomes extremely far-fetched when you actually examine the RNA structure and its specificity. The molecules do not naturally join together. In fact, they naturally fall apart and fast. This is why DNA and RNA do not last very long when a creature dies. But let's give Dr. Benner his RNA. That would still accomplish nothing. Evidently, these researchers have not stepped back to look at the big picture. RNA by itself, without pre-existing complex life, is utterly and completely useless. Do you know what RNA is used for? building proteins which build life. Complex biological machinery uses the RNA to make proteins. And the proteins make the complex biological machinery. So which came first? The RNA, the complex machinery which reads the RNA, or the proteins which make up the complex biological machinery and need complex biological machinery to be built into the complex biological machines? Hmm. These machines then combine with other machines to join onto cells and use the proteins. The other thing you don't really see in this animation is it's not just the RNA or the proteins or the complex machines. It's the information contained within the RNA that makes it useful. Just randomly putting RNA letters together without intelligent direction it's like trying to build Webster's Dictionary by randomly adding letters. Now, just like writing a dictionary, you need an outside directing intelligence to put the information into the book, or in this case, the RNA. Now, when you see a book, you know that the book had an author. Well, it's the same with RNA. All of this screams of the need for an incredibly smart outside intelligence. An intelligence vastly superior to all of our best minds on planet Earth put together. The first life requires a being of supernatural intelligence. Dr. Benner has not even come close to proposing how the first life arose. Instead, he has inadvertently admitted just how impossible it is to happen without an intelligent designer. I would suggest to you that rather this is all powerful proof of the fact of our Creator. 
it is also revealing of his character and qualities. His attention to detail, his power, his intelligence and knowledge. But just who is that creator? Well, when E.T. phones home, he no longer has to worry about just the NSA listening in on his conversation. The SETI project, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, decided to change tactics in their search for intelligence in outer space. Because apparently there's no intelligence here on Earth. We'd previously talked about the SETI project on Genesis Week, a strange project which seeks evidence of intelligence by listening for electronic transmissions from deep space that show evidence of being intelligently designed. Hey, we've been picking up Genesis Week from your satellite signals. We love it. It's way better than that Simpsons show you guys send us. The SETI group has decided to broaden their horizon and spectrum by tuning into laser light instead of just radio waves. Perhaps ET is phoning home using light waves instead of radio waves, and we should be on the lookout for intelligently designed communication using laser beams. Now, the irony has apparently been lost on the SETI group, who has uh, vociferously opposed the intelligent design movement saying intelligent design is unscientific. Yet they then use the scientific tool of intelligent design, saying that it is scientific and possible to recognize design in a radio wave or laser beam. And yet life, which is astonishingly more complex than silly radio waves or laser beams, somehow does not indicate an intelligent designer. Now, I hope you see the point I'm making here. These are very intelligent people. Why on earth would they contradict themselves in such stunning fashion? To openly criticize and ridicule those who say complexity is an indication of an intelligent designer, only to then turn around and say complex radio waves and laser beams are an indication of an intelligent designer. Well, there's no other way to put it. It's hypocrisy. Why? See, this is very much like the entire debate surrounding evolutionism. Science has nothing to do with it. This is philosophical in nature, hitting home at the very core of human nature, which resents and wants to reject their creator. Now, as a fellow human being, I sympathize. But denying the truth of the creator does not make him go away. We were created, as is evidenced by the complexity of life, that demands a designer. Who is that designer? None other than Jesus Christ, who became one of us, who willingly suffered along with us, who created a body to sacrifice in our place for your sins and mine. In more out of this world news, Dr. Russ Humphreys is at it again. You'll recall Dr. Humphreys had made multiple predictions regarding the magnetic fields of planets in our solar system based on the Young Creation model. Publishing six predictions in 1984 in the journal Creation Research Society Quarterly, five out of six of his predictions have now been fulfilled, while the evolutionary models all failed to explain the magnetic fields they measured. We will find out about Humphrey's sixth prediction in 2015 when the New Horizons spacecraft finally reaches Pluto. The naturalistic models of planetary origins rely upon the dynamo theory to explain planetary magnetic fields. Essentially, molten lavas within the core of a planet circulate, and this movement of the lavas produces the magnetic field. At the 2013 International Conference on Creationism, Dr. Humphreys detailed not only the astonishing predictive success of the young creation models, it turns out that the dynamo theories were a much bigger failure than originally thought. A century of failure. In 94 years since the first dynamo theory was penned, all the dynamo theories required a core in Earth many times larger than it is in order to work. No one has published any actual estimates, predictions, or numbers for modeling the Earth's dynamo and what it would take to produce a magnetic field. 
There is no laboratory experiment that can give an indication that the Earth could produce a dynamo. The biblical creation explanation, on the other hand, is simple. The planets are young, and when they were first created, the poles on their atoms were aligned, producing the magnetic field. This is why we are seeing magnetic fields in the planets, and why they are weakening. It's all young, just like the Bible says. Stick around, we'll be right back after this short break. This show is sponsored in part by Canada's first permanent creation museum in the heart of Alberta's dinosaur beds, the Big Valley Creation Science Museum, bbcsm.com. And by genesispark.com, where you can get your own beautiful hard-covered copy of the Chronicles of Dinosauria, the history and mystery of dinosaurs and man, now available from New Leaf Publishing. What does the Bible say about aliens? Is there life on other planets? What can science tell us about the possibility of aliens? Ian Juby gives answers to these and many more questions in this fascinating and highly disturbing subject. Looking analytically at the subject, complete with the testimonies of people who claim to have been abducted by aliens, the answers will probably surprise you. In this one and a half hour lecture, Ian shows that the alleged aliens are a problem and that Jesus is the solution. Order online today at Ian's Bookstore. for me? Ah! Yep, that's the one. East Vietnamese jumping spider. The venom is so strong that one bite can kill any child and 95% of adults. The surviving 5% typically slip into a coma for 3 to 6 months, only to wake up with permanent paralysis. Hmm. Thanks to all who wrote in over the summer months while I was off on break. Ian, I like how you present with both confidence and humor. It seems that if the creationists were faking it, had something to hide, played fast and loose with the facts, or were as fouled up as our opponents present us to be, there would be no joy or laughter in our writings as well as videos. Thanks for all you do. In our last episode aired before the summer break, we dismantled the evolutionary fossil sequence, showing that just because an animal isn't found in a specific layer, does not mean it was not there when the layer was formed. And thus the evolutionary fossil sequence does not exist. Amy Clark wrote in on YouTube. So if absence of a specific fossils in the fossil record do not prove the non-existence of a living creature in the past, why do you make such a big deal demanding scientists to show you transitional fossils in order for you to be convinced the theory of evolution is true? I'm sorry, sir, but your logic is a bit odd. I also feel that you underestimate your own God. Does he not love you enough to still send his son and die for your sins if not every word of the Bible is literal? Thanks for writing in, Amy. The question of whether a creature ever existed at all and when it existed are two completely different questions. Uh, we know for a fact that the coelacanth exists. It is found throughout the fossil record and even exists today. But as we saw, it is not found in the specific rock layers, which are supposed to represent a specific time frame where we know for a fact the coelacanth was around. Now you mentioned the need for transitional fossils. Not only that, but the proper sequence of those transitions. But considering there should have been at least many millions of all the transitional organisms, and they are absent from anywhere in the fossil record, means these transitions are simply wishful thinking and imagination. The alleged transitional fossils that are found are exceedingly few in number, and really built upon interpretation and assumptions. One of those assumptions is the fossil sequence, which was shown through multiple lines of evidence to be non-existent. So hopefully you see the difference I'm getting at. When we look at the fossil record with creatures for which we do have evidence of their existence, and the fossil sequence can be shown to be invalid, why then would you want to now throw in imaginary animals for which we have 
no evidence, not fossil or living. Now, as for the second part of your question, does God not love you enough to still send his son and die for your sins if not every word of the Bible is literal? Uh, well, of course, but that then brings up the question, how would we then know which parts of the Bible are literal and which parts are not? What about the part where God sends his son to die for us? Is that literal? <laughs> I would suggest that yes, it most certainly is literal. That and the warnings about what happens to those who refuse his unspeakable sacrifice. A punishment that was never intended for people. But it's the only other kingdom to inherit, should you choose to reject the kingdom of heaven. So certainly there are parts of the Bible that are allegorical or a parable, etc. But especially when it comes to eternity being on the line, I want to be sure I'm not assuming incorrectly about what's literal or not, wouldn't you? Another brilliant video, Ian. I really enjoyed this one, particularly the geological column explanation. Love and blessings to you, my friend. Keep doing what you're doing because you do it so well. Wonderful. I am continually amazed at your great communication skills. I love the mix of humor, neat graphics, and just plain facts and science in logical progression. Looking at the data only, it is obvious Darwinian evolution is impossible. Data from the fossil record as you show it here and now, with the admission that there is no such thing as junk DNA, makes belief in a common ancestor of all living things an anti-science proposition. Keep up, keep up the good work in and all the best to you. Thanks to everyone who wrote in and thank you for watching. Remember, if you're catching this program via YouTube, you can share it with your friends on TwitFace Plus using the convenient share button down below. And we want to hear from you. You can send in your comments, questions, and letter bombs to us in a number of ways. You can email us at comments at genesisweek.com or you can send us a tweet at genesisweek or you can post a comment on our Facebook page or you can head to genesisweek.com, which is our YouTube channel. Find the most recent show and post a comment there. I'm your host, Ian Juby, reminding you of those words of warning and comfort from our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. We'll see you next week. We are a viewer-supported program and need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us, and if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to Core Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K 2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at ianjuby.org slash donations, and thank you for your support. Thank you.